Hi, this is Skip Stewart, Vice President and Chief Improvement Officer with Baptist Memorial Healthcare. And today we are so incredibly honored to have two of my friends, Dr. Edgar Schein and Peter Schein. Ed and Peter, would you uh, please kind of tell us about your background and about some of the great work that y'all have been involved in? Well, I'm by training a social psychologist. I got a PhD at Harvard, and then I got involved in early in my career in the uh, MIT Sloan Business School, where I spent happily over 50 years. Uh, teaching management, uh, consulting with organizations. And uh, after I retired and came out here to, uh, to rest up, I thought I was all done. But then while I was in the middle of writing my autobiography, Peter showed up at my door and said, Dad, let's work together and write some books together. So I started a whole brand new career and very happily am pursuing it now. Uh, yeah, and for me, it was also career pivot. I had spent about 30 years at companies like Apple and Silicon Graphics and Sun Microsystems and a bunch of startups. So a sort of early internet and, and <coughs> maturing internet uh, Silicon Valley career for myself. And then uh, through that, learned a bunch of things that, that uh, over the years, Ed and I talked about and thought, wow, there's, there's, there's a lot to, to uh, write about and to uh, uh, to tell stories about for what we both learned in Silicon Valley and how it related to some of Ed's earlier consulting work. So in 2015, we started the Organizational Culture and Leadership Institute to um, do consulting and, and write books. We've written four books together and uh, uh, who knows, maybe many more. Well, that, that's great. We are going to talk a lot about in this video series, we're going to talk a lot about the second edition of Humble Inquiry that just recently came out uh, here in February of 2021. And uh, we're going to specifically focus in on both the skill and the attitude of Humble Inquiry. And we're going to tell some stories in this video series so that folks can see Humble Inquiry in action. But for right now, in this very first video, I want to kind of set the stage, uh, putting humble inquiry in some context. And that context is what I call a system. We tend to all work and thrive and live inside of a system, many of us. And some folks may know that, but they may not understand the implications of that. So here's a simple definition of a system. Uh, a system is a whole that cannot be separated into individual parts. A whole that cannot be separated into individual parts. Now, healthcare is arguably the most complicated socio-technical system that exists. And so we're gonna talk a lot about this socio-technical system we call healthcare because it's made up of complex interdependent systems. Therefore, we need relationships and therefore we need humble inquiry. Let me give a simple story and I'll have you your thoughts and remarks on this in a minute, Ed and Peter. Uh, I remember a friend of mine, Dr. Jones, was recently reminiscing and reflecting and he, he was telling me a story about this amazing uh, surgical technologist named Ruby. And Ruby worked for him for five years in the OR. And then she later transitioned into the ambulatory setting where she worked for him at his clinic as a uh, technologist there. And as he was reflecting on the many years of working together, he remembers times where he was so dependent on Ruby. He recalled this one story where he was cutting out a lesion from someone's left arm and he incorrectly documented it on the right arm. Now, Ruby was in charge of labeling the specimen and doing all the paperwork for pathology. So as she was collecting the data for that, she recognized that he incorrectly documented she took it upon herself to correct it, let Dr. Jones know about it, and then have him initial. As he reflected on that story, he told me, he says there were many times where things like that occurred, and he realized that Ruby was correct 100% of the time, but more importantly, he realized how dependent he was on Ruby. So once again, this socio-technical system that we call healthcare is made up of these complex interdependent systems 
And to work interdependently, we need relationships with each other. And humble inquiry is a way to help build those relationships. Ed and Peter, what uh, thoughts and comments would you have about what I've said? I'll, I'll take the first cut at this <clears throat> because the concept of a socio-technical system and interdependence actually grew out of a very interesting set of post-war experiences in the 1940s, where in the British coal mines, they had originally a technology where miners stood few feet apart with hammers and knocked the coal loose, put it in a bucket, and those buckets then were taken to some central place. And they had invented something to replace what they called this uh, short wall system. They had a long wall machine that could take 20, 30 feet of the coal face and automatically knock down the coal into preset bins. So they installed that system in some of the mines and the miners went on strike. They totally refused to use this technically better long wall system of mining. And first the, the investigators, the social scientists from the Tavistock Institute in London thought this was just a, a wage issue, you know, we'll pay them more. But they began to think that these miners were adamant about refusing to work this long wall machine. So they sent in someone uh, who was more oriented toward the social side of things and asked the miners, you know, in a more friendly way, wait a minute, what's going on here? This will make your work easier. Uh, it's much easier than hammering uh, on the coal face yourself. So what, what is it that you don't like about this machine? And they said, well, there are several things. In the normal method, we were talking to each other and we could reassure each other that the mind would not collapse. The, the relationship of being next to each other reduced our anxiety. And when the machine puts us 30 feet apart, we can't talk to each other which makes us more anxious, which makes us feel this is horrible work. And so the reason why they refused it had nothing to do with the ease of the technology. It had everything to do with the social relationships in the mind. So the Tavistock people then said, oh, we're dealing with a socio-technical system here. And if the miners are feeling anxious with the new machine, we have to give them some alternative social mechanisms to enable them to do that kind of work, which eventually they talked through with the miners, you know, how could we get both the benefit of the technology and get you to work and be less anxious. But the, the nub of that story is the history, if you think about it, from the 1950s to today, that organizations on the whole have gone from the short wall, linear, simple, mechanical, technical systems today to, as you described it, the hospital, which is a not only a long wall system, but it involves subsystems that connect to each other. And the key point and why relationships are so critical is that there are really two kinds of interdependence. In the old system, there was linear interdependence. The miners put the coal in the buckets and the buckets had to be sent to some central place where it's on. And each of those steps had to work. But it was fairly easy to supervise and make sure they all worked, like in a fire brigade. Then 
with technology getting more complicated, we discovered really that the more common difficult problem is simultaneous interdependence. Now, what is simultaneous interdependence? It's two kids on a seesaw. They both have to do it right or they can't get the fun. It's the baton pass in a relay race. No matter how fast you are, if you screw up the pass, you're either going to drop the baton or lose time and you will lose the race. And as we now look at today's organizations and why we think relationships are more crucial than ever, it's because we are seeing more and more examples like the doctor and his assistant of simultaneous interdependency. If, if that assistant was alert and he was about to work on the wrong arm, she would immediately say, doctor, no, 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 it's the other arm. She would recognize that she can't allow him or her to make a mistake. So today we are living in this complex interdependent world where many relationships are simultaneously interdependent. We have to discover them and then we have to enable them to build relationships with each other. And in enabling that, we need something like humble inquiry as a relationship building process. And I think it would be useful if, if now Peter talked a little bit about why humble and why inquiry. Right, yeah. I, I just wanna go back though quickly to, um, uh, you know, Ed, Ed quoted the Tavistock folks from the 40s. I'm gonna go a little further back to T.S. Eliot in 1934, you know, the great playwright um, and poet, uh, who was commenting, uh, I think this is in a play called The Rocks. It's very obscure, but I love this quote. It's commenting on humans facing sort of uh, challenges and, and, uh, and, you know, existential angst and, and was referring that we respond by dreaming of systems so perfect that no one will need to be good. And that has always struck me as really captures this distinction between the system and the people. And um, the idea about humility is that it brings the people back into the system in a way that um, allows information sharing, which is the key to the system, uh, not just being perfect, but actually functioning uh, in a way beyond what it was designed to do. Um, another way of thinking about this is that um, interdependence is really something that's de defined as the interactions between the roles in the system. Um, but at some level, the roles in the system could be could be fulfilled or played by a bot or an AI. It's when the system has to be resilient and has to flex and has to... Um, find ways to adapt in the face of increasing complexity, that's where humans need to be good, right? That's where human needs, humans need to interact with each other in spontaneous and adaptive and positive ways. And so what we talk about humility is sort of a, is a substrate for that kind of acting well toward each other, acting good toward each other. And um, it starts with embracing the fact that you don't have the answers, that there's something in the group, there's something in this, this simultaneously interdependent system that uh, somebody knows that's relevant, that will impact uh, the course of action or, or could impact the course of action and does impact what's you know, what's correct or what's a, what's an accident or, you know, a safety issue. And so humility, uh, or what we refer to as here and now humility in, in the humble leadership books that we'll talk about further, um, 
means that you, you uh, as the surgeon or as anybody really in the team accepts the fact that your knowledge, your information is bounded and the group collectively um, knows more. And if everybody um, builds a sort of set of a, a, a sense of openness and trust to share information that's pertinent in the moment, in the here and now, that's when you start to develop a, a good system that does perform um, to expectations, but can perform beyond expectations. I'd like to add one other word. <clears throat> the machine is a technical system. So I think the people who now uh, emphasize what Peter just said, talk about open systems. And this derives from the fact that there have been a lot of things written that say basically human systems are different. Human systems are different and they're different primarily because you can never reduce them to a machine, partly because of the, the humanness of all of us, and partly because we exist in interconnection with other open systems. And it's that interconnection, the fact that we live in open environments that are constantly creating new challenges for us, that requires open systems thinking to be innovative and perpetually adaptive. Machines don't have to adapt. They just run until they're done. Human systems, by definition, have to perpetually adapt. And that is sometimes a, a different technical adaptation. And that is sometimes, like with the miners, a different social adaptation. But this idea of openness is crucial to the idea of a system. It's not enough to say system because machines are systems. Humans are open systems. The hospital is an open system and it consists of a lot of open systems inside the hospital that are all connected to each other. Wow, that was really, really good. And I, I, can't, I could listen to that for a long time. So to our audience that's watching this, uh, this is the first of a set of series. Uh, in the next video, we'll be talking about uh, different types of relationships, and uh, we'll be even defining what we mean uh, even more with the, the attitude yeah. and the skill of humble inquiry. So uh, until then, thank you so much, Ed and Peter, and look forward to future conversations. Thank you. Thank you.